Welcome. I'm Professor Rob Walcott of the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. And we're here today at the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico, one of the birthplaces of chaos and complexity theory worldwide. We're privileged to be guests of David Krakauer, the CEO of the Santa Fe Institute. For those of us who don't know much about the Santa Fe Institute, what is it? The Santa Fe Institute was built to essentially revolutionize science. And so a modest objective. A right? modest objective. <laughs> and our mission is essentially searching for order in the complexity of evolving worlds. And so essentially what we study is adaptive systems from cells to societies. And it was founded in 1984, a group of very illustrious scientists, including several Nobel laureates. And they sought to explore complex phenomena, which basically means adaptive phenomena, mm. and take all of the rigors and frameworks of mathematical physics and computation and apply them to the adaptive world. And we do so in a very non-traditional way. We have no departments, no schools, no disciplines, no tenure, uh, just a large networked community of about 250 researchers who spend from a day to a decade or more here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in conversation, discussing complexity science. And so the culture of the Institute is playful, it's rigorous, uh, we're mathematical and computational at our core, but we keep dialogue in play. And people who come here are willing to have very open-ended discussions about a vast range of, a range of topics. And I think that the, that mixture of, of a solid grounding, but with a very playful, um, right. exploratory attitude is very rare. So I, I have to say, earlier today, we were together in a conference room here talking about a variety of topics. And at one point, you said, you know, there are a few researchers here at the Institute that are dead center for what we're talking about. Do you mind if I bring them in? Totally unrehearsed, totally unplanned. And you, you went out, you brought a few, a couple of postdocs, a couple of very senior researchers from around the world who are here. And you said to them, look, you're not prepped for this. Give us 10 minutes. What are you working on? And I, I was immensely impressed by how every single person you brought in was able to, with a non-expert audience, explain very clearly what it was they were working on. And I, and I have to say uh, that's probably rare in terms of institutions having people who can do that with their work. I think it is rare. I think there's something about working in an environment where you can't assume the person you're talking to ah, right. knows your field. Even if they're brilliant, even if they have an Im immense background, it might be very different from your background. Yeah, I mean, if you have someone who's working in quantum cosmology right. and they're talking to a Mayan archaeologist, right. they might both be the leaders of their fields, but they can't assume they know anything about their respective right. And even domains. their nomenclature is different and you have to translate everything. Absolutely. So right. there is a sense in which we are trained by virtue of the challenge we face to communicate perhaps more willingly than a standard academic. You lead one of the most intense and creative intellectual enterprises in the world. You have researchers who are colleagues of yours from all over the planet who are experts in their particular field. They, they thrive on a certain level of independence. How do you play the role of a leader in this kind of knowledge-based enterprise? Yeah, it's a... It's a question for which there is no good answer. <laughs> and um, there are a few core beliefs that I have. Um, I believe in individuals and their talents. I believe in freedom, right? And I believe in community. I also believe in rigor and challenging authority and challenging nonsense. And um, it's extraordinary how many glass cages we've built that limit individual freedom, individual debate, and individual argument. Argument mm. is not a bad thing, mm. right? It's how we come to understand things, exposing our mistakes. Mm. In an environment where you have trust, I think that's extremely important. And so the Santa Fe Institute is a network of researchers. It's global. And in that sense, it's already different from most organizations because you're always seeing new people. And um, what you try and do is build institutions that support the network um, and support freedom. 
Um, and so we're constantly experimenting with different formats for discussion. Um, you know, we have a seminar called the, the Reckless Ideas Seminar, where the premise is you stand up and you be reckless. What, what do you mean by a reckless idea? Well, let's say that there's some crazy thought you've had, and under ordinary circumstances, you might only tell one or two people at a bar or something. Mm. Well, we think sometimes those are really interesting ideas. I want you to tell the entire community that with its collective expertise, with an understanding that it's that kind of idea. Mm. And let's build from there. And it's extremely rare. Most people will over-prepare, mm. right? They've got all their PowerPoints. Right. And, uh, and that has value. It has value, right? Once you've distilled the idea and perfected right. it. But in those early embryonic phases where you're germinating a concept, there would also be a benefit of, from community. But we don't really like that because typically what community does in most institutions is kill it. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. So we're constantly exploring ways in which we can, in some sense, amplify this early phase. Yes. Uh, most institutions, I would claim, are about scaling and perfecting, not about exploring. And, and we're just a part of a larger ecology, right? I don't think the Santa Fe Institute, there should be too many of us. I think that <laughs> we, we play very well with universities mm -hmm. because there's something we do that's difficult for them and they do things that would be very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. We don't have critical mass in any one area. Mm -hmm. And so to be a leader of an institute like this requires some humility in the sense that you're surrounded. I wouldn't say I'm a colonel with an army of generals. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, how does that work? Or, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a conductor without an orchestra. You know, it's like, so you sort of lead by example yeah. and you set a tone. So that's interesting. Uh, reckless ideas and create that ferment. They, they're sort of like they're sort of like intentional mutations. And from your evolutionary background, create lots of intentional mutations and see what might stick. And then if it might stick and somebody finds it fit to pursue, then some of your researchers might carry it forward and pursue it. Otherwise, they might look at it and say, "Well, that didn't work," and they and they kill it. Yeah, I think that's a very high level of experimentation. Um, and, you know, there's this, we're going through this phase of obsession with failure. Here at the Institute no, or I in general? No, I think in culture, everyone says failure is a wonderful thing. I, I totally disagree with that. Yeah, I do too. Right? I, I tell companies, you know, the whole notion that. of celebrating failure, it's a non-starter, forget it. Yeah, what you celebrate yeah. is experiments. Yes, learning. Right? Learning. Right. And then, I mean, people like this idea. It's a sort of a feel-good philosophy that says, yeah. here we celebrate failures. And I say, here we, we celebrate success, <laughs> but, we, uh, but we also celebrate experiments, and many experiments right. fail. But I'm much more interested in the successful experiments than the failed experiments. Right? Well, translating this into a yeah. business environment, which yeah. is, is my realm, I, 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 I bring this topic up all the time. Because the innovation experts, it's my field, will yeah. come in and say, celebrate failure. Right. And, and I, I, I've never really seen that work very well. Right. But one thing that does work is when you realize that many times people refer to something as failure, was really just a hypothesis test, yes. and they falsified it. Yes. And that's called science. Yes. We're supposed to identify hypotheses to which we do not know for sure the answer. We're supposed to go out and test them and learn. Sometimes we're right, great. And sometimes we're wrong, great, if we did it right. right. Now, then again, if we spend $100 million to develop a product and launch it to market and it fails, that's failure. That's and we failure. don't celebrate that. We don't. So we have to change the nomenclature to experimentation, to learning. Exactly. That's what we're doing in the early stages. Exactly. I, you know, I remember having a conversation with one of our founders, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Murray Gell Mann, about mm -hmm. this. And you know, he was in a meeting and someone made that remark about failure. And he said, you know, wrong ideas can be interesting. <laughs> but correct ideas are great. <laughs> yeah. and, I think, and I think he, of course, and I think what I think people are trying to say mm. in code is give me the freedom. Right. And I think what we can do is say give them the freedom, right? We can short circuit that, mm. dance around the true problem, right. which, be, which is being articulated as embracing failure. And I think... There is something in the collective consciousness that is asking to be released. Mm. And we should recognize that, right? But 
we should do it in a more interesting way. So speaking of dancing around problems, mm -hmm. that's something you've done for your entire career <laughs> uh, with great success, mm -hmm. also some learnings. Mm -hmm. What is something from your decades of research experience that surprised you? Something that, you, boy, you really didn't expect that one. And, and what did it mean? You know, it's interesting. I grew up surrounded by mathematical physicists and mathematicians and was always amazed by how much of the universe they could explain. And I came to the understanding that they could do that because the worlds they studied were so simple. It didn't mean the mathematics was easy. Meaning they, limit, they delimited the space no, within I which mean, they were exploring? The, the non-complex world. In other words, they were dealing with phenomena. A hydrogen atom here is like a hydrogen atom there. I see. The, the laws of... Mechanics. Mechanics or electromagnetism are the same there as they are there. Mm. And the world that I was living in is like nothing like right, that. Right. Like, God, everything's different. It has people in it. There's people in it. <laughs> or others people got right. you know, ants in it, right? right. Yeah. And, and then I made this discovery when I first became interested in complexity sciences. Wait a minute. We're looking at the wrong level, the wrong resolution. What if you represent ants and humans as networks? What if you consider scale? What if you consider information? how much information they store. And all of a sudden, some of those extraordinary regularities that physicists had had mm -hmm. access to were revealed in the complex world. Mm. So there's a prospect of doing what they did, mm. but with phenomena where I always imagined it would be impossible. And it's been this story of finding the right level, um, the right structure or representation to work with, and that's been extraordinary, I think. And your surprise has been how much we have been able to accomplish in yes. this respect? Yes, how much we've, not only how much we've been able to accomplish, which I think in the, in the scale of things is very modest, but the fact that you can do it. Mm. I mean, I think, you know, go back 50 years and someone were to tell you, you know what, the genome is just like the brain. Genes are like a nervous system, mm. you'd think, right. <laughs> and, and now there are principled reasons that we can say this mm. um, because we understand some fundamental principles of regulation in life. And so the discovery that there was a simplicity in mm. complexity mm. in the same way there was simplicity in simplicity yeah. has been something of a revelation. Really. Simplicity in complexity. So the story, given that you're sharing a surprise that you've experienced over the years, suggests, correct me if I'm wrong, that when you entered this realm of complexity theory to attempt to do what you were just saying, you had significant doubts that it was even possible to do it well. Absolutely. I mean, and when, yet you took the jump anyway. Yes. Why? No, oh, that's a good question. Because there are certainly a lot of easier ways to, to, to rise in a career than doing that. Well, you want, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, it comes down to this curiosity mm. and it, a desire to understand the universe. Mm. And you don't want to stop. You don't want to say, I've understood star formation, and that's where we stop, mm. and now we replace it with narrative. Mm. Um, it's always pushing the boundaries of what you can understand in a fundamental level. And that overwhelmed the very real prospect of not making much progress. Mm. And then the discovery that there were ways that we could describe these systems, a new language and a new level where all of a sudden the regularities emerged was extraordinary. I think it's going to change science in the 21st century. I think it already has this to many, in many mm -hmm. ways. So uh, a personal question. You've accomplished much in your career. You're in a position to do much more. What is something as you approach the end of your life in a hundred years. Thank you. <laughs> I no, thought really? no problem. <laughs> yes. I'm in the same boat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feels, what is feels something about which you will be most proud? You know, my own research is trying to understand the evolution of intelligence and stupidity. And yes, people laugh. People always think that's amusing. And there are countless institutes dedicated 
to the analysis of, of intelligence. Stupidity. Of intelligence. <laughs> Most of them are stupid. Yeah. That's right. Where is the professor of stupidity? Where is the institute that deals with the Earth's number one problem? Mm. From which all other problems derive. Our inability to think rigorously and carefully through a problem, but rather apply prejudices and rules mm. that are inappropriate for the task at hand. So for me, the great... If I could work out a new, unified approach to thinking about intelligence and stupidity um, that could cross the scales from physics through to society, um, and it would help people reason through real-world problems, that would be a tremendous contribution. Is part of the solution dealing with cognitive biases, understanding them, and, and helping people to understand when they're facing these? It, it does. You know, it's interesting that it absolutely is an element of it. Um, and there are extraordinary people like Danny Kahneman and others who work on those. But they're very focused only on humans. Mm. And if you're interested in the origin of intelligence and stupidity on Earth, Mm. You have to consider stupidity in non -humans. In other organisms. And you also have to consider stupidity at the institutional aggregate level. Well, there's plenty of that. And there's plenty of it. <laughs> and we call it bureaucracy. Yes. And so I think that that larger, more panoramic approach to the problem, it won't be as detailed mm. as the psychological theories of decision-making and decision habits, but it will be more all-encompassing and will allow us to recognize the same mistakes or the same insights when they're performed across different species on the planet, which would be an amazing thing. Last question. One to three words to describe, hyphens are acceptable, to describe the experience of being a scientist. One to three words, hyphens are acceptable, to describe the experience of being a scientist. Ecstatic and intimidating. Intimidating to who? To me. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, in many ways, David, you're intimidating to many people <laughs> and also create a great deal of inspiration. Planets and stars don't learn or have a sense of purpose. Pushing the boundaries, free will, privacy, dignity, control, trust, understanding the individual, understanding the collective, and the collectives are fundamentally changing in the coming generations. We must face the darkness, and we're glad that we have people like you holding a lantern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.